This, this is, is Saurabh, and, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, show The Weekly show, show with Aditya. After nearly six weeks of pushing and shoving, we are coming to an end of the 20 over domestic World Cup, often erroneously called the best 20 over domestic tournament in the world. Whether this is the best 20 over domestic tournament in the world is debatable, but all the individuals employed directly or indirectly with the tournament have no option but to say it. But apart from the rhetoric of whether it's the best 20 over domestic tournament, finally it's coming to an end. Six weeks of drama and suspense and the conversation around subjects such as bio bubble and containment zones and the familiar site of discussions around net run rate teams stuck on equal points while the Mumbai capitals have qualified for the semi-finals or in the more complicated version the playoffs and the qualifier one and three teams in Chennai, Punjab and Rajasthan have been eliminated from this competition. Four teams are jostling for three spots as far as the semi-finalists are concerned. Teams like Delhi Indians, Sunrisers, Bangalore, Royal Challengers, Hyderabad and Kings Eleven. Calcutta. By design and default, the stakeholders involved are calling the best tournament so far in its 13 and a half year history, but that is once again debatable because this happens every year. Teams are eliminated, some still hang on by the barest of margins. And other teams affected by abstracts such as net run rate wait for other teams results as far as them going forward or being eliminated in the competition are concerned. But it has become once again a question of ifs and buts. If this team had got their draft right, if this team had drafted the correct player for correct situations or if the team had selected the correct team for the correct situation is a debate which happens every year. And despite all the discourse about the coaching staff being an element, once again I reiterate the coach is an important but a passive stakeholder. Once the match starts and whatever decisions are made pre-match whether they are implemented, executed and the plan comes off is totally on the players on the field and despite the attempts to introduce the idea of timeout where the coaching staff comes into the ground and gives tips to the players involved as to what to do and what not to do. They are just what they are tips. Whether the plan comes off or not is coincidental. While tonight's match between Delhi and Bangalore will decide which team seals its number two position with 16 points, tomorrow's match between Bombay and Hyderabad will decide whether Calcutta or Hyderabad will be the number four team. Though it is also possible that if Hyderabad beats Bombay by a big margin and one of Delhi and Bangalore loses by a big margin, then one between Delhi and Bangalore will be eliminated purely on net run rate while Calcutta and Hyderabad will sneak into the fourth semi-finalist position along with Mumbai and the winner between Delhi and Bangalore. But there is a chance that Mumbai will become five-time domestic champions. On the other hand, Delhi and Bangalore are looking for their maiden championship while Calcutta and Hyderabad are looking to add to their 
championship trophy looking to become three time and two time champions respectively but like last year's 50 over international world cup is there a chance that we might see two teams who have never won a world cup enter the semi finals or will we see on morgan lead calcutta to the finals and then become only the second captain to win both an international and a domestic world cup the conversation about whether this tournament is the only 20 over tournament and the best 20 over tournament in recent times is something i do not agree with the australian version is equally competitive even though the indian cricket board does not allow indian players to play in this because of contractual obligations and the fear that the indian version will be diluted if indian players play in other such domestic tournaments and this year with all the discussion around bio bubbles and containment zones and players being away from their families and loved ones there is even the possibility that a few players may not even play the australian version the players like warner smith ben stokes josh butler the villiers are planning to skip the australian 20 over version why because they have been away from their homes from too long and stuck in quarantine and bio bubble situations but these same individuals they not skip the indian 20 over versions those who do skip are seen as antagonists and villains and we already know who such individuals are and the players will do anything to play in this tournament there is nothing there whom boards can do they will have to give them the noc and those who don't get the noc rue the fact that they have lost about what is about 10 years worth of income in just 60 days time and such factors pull them in to play the tournament who would want to skip irrespective of their teams winning or losing over the past 200 days the fantasy created around this illusionary virus has made us negative it's not just about the idea of negativity but the way people are behaving and saying that their lifestyle has changed when we know that all such conversations are a smoke screen to say that we have changed our attitude over the past 200 days believe me no such thing has happened but through this song let's try to inject some logic in people and say that move away from this fantasy moment i have a dream a song to sing to help me go with anything if you see the wonder of a fairy tale you can take the future even if you fail i believe in angels something good in everything i see i believe in angels when i know the time is right for me i'll cross the stream i have a dream i have a dream a fantasy to help me through reality and my destination makes it worth the while pushing through the darkness still another mile i believe in angels something good in everything i see i believe in angels when i know the time is right for me i'll cross the stream i have a dream i'll cross the stream i have 
a dream. I have a dream, a song to sing to help me cope with anything. If you see the wonder of a fairy tale, you can take the future even if you fail. I believe in angels, something good in everything I see. I believe in angels when I know the time is right for me. I'll cross the stream, I have a dream. I'll cross the stream, I have a dream. P.G. Woodhouse Stiff Upper Lip Jeeves Gussie once told me that when he, Gussie, was introduced to him, Basse, as the fellow who was to marry his Basse's offspring, he, Basse, had stared at him with his jaw dropping and then in a sort of strangled voice had said, What? Incredulously, if you see what I mean, as if he were hoping that they were just playing a jolly practical joke on him and that in new quotes the real chap would jump out from behind a chair and say April Fool and when he Basse at last got onto it that there was no deception and that Gussie was really what he had drawn he went off in a corner and sat there motionless refusing to speak when spoken to. Little wonder then that Stiffy's announcement had bucked him up like a dose of Dr. Somebody's tonic swamp juice, which acts directly on the red corpuscles and imparts a gentle flow. He loved, he gurgled, that's right, with the cook, with none other. That's why I said there wasn't going to be any dinner. We shall have to make do with hard boiled eggs if there are any left over from the treat. The mention of hard boiled eggs made Pop Basse wince for a moment and one could see that his thoughts had flitted back to the tea tent. But he was far too happy to allow sad memories to trouble him for long. With a wave of the hand, he dismissed dinner as something that didn't matter one way or the other. The basses, the babe suggested, could rough it if they had to. Are you sure of your facts, my dear? I met them as they were starting off. Bassey said he hoped I wouldn't mind him borrowing my car. You reassured him, I trust. Oh yes, I said. That's all right, Gussie. Help yourself. Good girl, good girl. An excellent response. Then they have really gone with the wind. And they plan to get married as soon as Gussie can get a special license. You have to apply to the Archbishop of Canterbury and I'm told he stings you for quite a bit. Money well spent. That's how Gussie feels. He told me he was dropping the cook at Bertie's aunt's place and then going on to London to confer with the Archbishop. He is full of zeal. This extraordinary statement that Gussie was landing Emerald Stoker on Aunt Dahelia brought my head up with a jerk. I found myself speculating on how the old flesh and blood was going to take the intrusion and it gave me rather an odd feeling to think how deep Gussie's love for his M must be to make him face such fearful risks. The aged relative has a strong personality and finds no difficulty when displeased in reducing the object of her displeasure to a spot of grease in a matter of minutes. 
I am told that sportsman whom in her hunting days she had occasion to rebuke for riding over hounds were never the same again and for months would go about in a sort of stupor staring at sudden noises. My head being now up, I was able to see Pop Basset and I found that he was regarding me with an eye so benevolent that I could hardly believe that this was the same ex-magistrate with whom I had so recently been hobnobbing, if you can call it hobnobbing, when a couple of fellows sit in a couple of chairs for 20 minutes without saying a word to each other. It was plain that joy had made him the friend of all the world even to the extent of allowing him to look at Bertram without a shudder. He was more like something out of Dickens than anything human. Your glass is empty, Mr. Booster, he cried buoyantly. May I refill it? I said he might. I had had two, which is generally my limit, but with my aplomb shattered as it was, I felt that a third wouldn't hurt. Indeed, I would have been willing to go even more deeply into the thing. I once read about a man who used to drink 26 martinis before dinner and the conviction was beginning to steal over me that he had the right idea. Roderick tells me he proceeded as sunny as if a crack of his had been greeted with a laughter in court that the reason you were unable to be with us at the school treat this afternoon was that urgent family business called you to Brinkley Court. I trust everything turned out satisfactorily. Oh yes, thanks. We all missed you, but business before pleasure, of course. How was your uncle? You found him well, I hope. Yes, he was fine. And your aunt, she had gone to London. Indeed, you must have been sorry not to have seen her. I know few women I admire more. So hospitable, so breezy. I have seldom enjoyed anything more than my recent visit to her house. Seven Ages of Man from Shakespeare's As You Like It. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwillingly to school, and then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad, made to his mistress's eyebrow, then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, Jealous in the honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth, and then the justice, in fair round belly with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon. With spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound, last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history, his second 
childishness and mere oblivion. So deep, so eyes, so taste, so everything. Agatha Christie, The Labors of Hercules, Chapter 1. Hercule Poirot nodded thoughtfully. He said, I comprehend. He added, it is like this. You see, I wrote a letter to my friend here. Mrs. Hart's face cleared. That explains it. I must have noticed the name on an envelope. But really, we have so many ex-army gentlemen staying here or passing through. Let me see now. She peered up at the board. Hercule Poirot said, It is not there now. It must have been returned to the postman, I suppose. I am so sorry. Nothing important, I hope. No, no, it was of no importance. As he moved towards the door, Mrs. Hart, enveloped in her pungent odor of violets, pursued him. If your friend should come, it is most unlikely I must have made a mistake. Turns said Mrs. Hart are very moderate. Coffee after dinner is included. I would like you to see one or two of our bed sitting rooms. With difficulty, Hercule Poirot escaped. The drawing room of Mrs. Samuelson was larger, more lavishly furnished and enjoyed an even more stifling amount of central heating than that of Lady Hogan. Hercule Poirot picked his way giggedly amongst gilded console tables and large groups of jewelry. Mrs. Samuelson was taller than Lady Hogan and her head was dyed with peroxide. Her Pekingese was called Nanki Poo. His bulging eyes surveyed Hercule Poirot with arrogance. Miss Cabell, Mrs. Samuelson's companion, was thin and scraggy, where Miss Carnaby had been plump, but she also was voluble and slightly breathless. She too had once been blamed for Nanki Poo's disappearance, but really, Mr. Poirot, it was the most Amazing thing. It all happened in a second. Outside Harrods it was. A nurse there asked me the time. Harrod interrupted her. Nurse, a hospital nurse? No, no, a children's nurse. Such a sweet baby it was too. A dear little mite. Such lovely rosy cheeks. They say children don't look healthy in London, but I'm sure. Ellen said Mrs. Samuelson. Miss Cable blushed, stammered and subsided into silence. Mrs. Samuelson said acidly. And while Miss Cable was bending over a param, perambulator, had nothing to do with her. This audacious villain cut Nanki Poo's lead and made off with him. Miss Cable murmured tearfully. It all happened in a second. I looked around and the darling boy was gone. There was just the dangling lead in my hand. Perhaps you would like to see the lead, Mr. Poirot? No means, said Poirot hastily. He had no wish to make a collection of cut dog leads. I understand, he went on, that shortly afterwards you received a letter. Story follows the same course exactly. The letter, the threats of violence to Nanki Poo's ears and tail. Only two things were different. The sum of money demanded, 300 pounds, and the address to which it was to be sent. This time it was to Commander Blackley, Harrington Hotel 76, Clonmel Gardens, Kensington. For more awesome content, 
Tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.